My name is Ian Cox. Um, I'm here to talk to you about Trident 4. Trident 4 is our latest data center and campus chip. Um, for when I say the wrong thing, this is co 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 covering me legally. And yes, I will defer answering questions which are above my pay grade. Okay. We build three optimized product lines. We build, tom we build Tomahawk for the highest bandwidth for hyperscale fabrics. The chip I'm going to talk about now is Trident, which is feature-rich programmable for the cloud edge and enterprise. And then we have Jericho. Jericho is our service provider chip, which is scale-out buffers, um, deep buffers, deep queues, and is for like service provider carrier-grade applications. And we optimize the different chips for different, the different product lines for different places in the network and needs. Okay. We've increased the bandwidth of Trident 20 times since we introduced the original Trident in 2010, which was 64 by 10 gig. So we went from Trident to Trident 2 to Trident 3, which was 3.2 terabytes, which is 32 by 100. And then we did Trident 4, which was 128 by 100. Um, Trident, the other thing is Trident 3 was our first programmable version of the Trident line, but it wasn't programmable by end customers. It wasn't, com or it was programmable by us, but you know, we could, our, cu our customers could ask us to add new features, and we could, we've done that with Trident 3. Trident 4 is the first chip we've produced, which is if the customer wants to, they could program it all themselves. And it's a compiler-driven um, data flow. So Trident, Trident 4 we sampled in June of 2019. No, it uses 7 nanometers. It's a 12.8 terabit per second chip. It's 50 gig PAM 430s. And I was very happy to ship this chip because it's a programmable. Um, the goal on Trident 4 was to produce a single chip architecture which could be used throughout like the campus and also in the enterprise data center. Um, it has a comprehensive concurrent feature set. One of our design goals when we designed the programmable chip was it needed to support all the features our fixed chip did beforehand. So it's like, you know, we analyzed what was in the fixed chip and made sure, and we wrote the code so we could make that run in a compilable chip. Because no customer wants to use, have less features than their previous version or have things dropped out. I have all these weird compromises happening. Um, the compiler program will make it more future-proof, like we've added features to Trident 4 after, uh, after it was finished ourselves, so, you know, as things are changing. Um, it has a lot of advanced instrumentation. Customers can create new advanced instrumentation by changing the program code. Um, and it has industry-leading packet buffers and databases. It's like one of the things on the Trident line compared to Tomahawk is normally the, the FIBs and the ACLs are much larger than on the Tomahawks. Um, one of the things to make it much easier for system vendors to actually bring Tomahawk for the market was we made it pin compatible with Tomahawk 3, which was our first 12.8 terabit device, which was shipped a few, year, a few years ago. So it's like they could take a Tomahawk 3 board, take the Tomahawk 3 off, put the Tomahawk 4 on, Voila, they have a system. We do that. It, ma it makes it easier. It's like board, board designs are expensive. The more, more, more we can facilitate the ecosystem to pick up a new chip, the be better it is for everyone. Oh, and Tomahawk 4, sorry, Trident 4 supports from 10 gig to 400 gig on the 30s. We have too many 4s. <laughs> Okay, so Trident 4, 4 is, a family, is a family of devices. There's a 12 terabit device, an 8 terabit device. The 12 terabit's mainly targeted at the data center top of rack and the data center network for the enterprise. It could also be used as a data center spine or a converged core. And then we expect for the campus and distribution, you know, it would be like a 4 terabit and a 2 terabit device being used down, down in the, those areas of the network. They'll have exactly the same operational consistency, the same programming model, the same programming pipeline. You can do all the same features and things on them. They'll just be different sizes. It's like you don't exactly need mostly 128 by 100 gig in the wiring closet. But you know that would be 
I'd like to see the wiring closet, but. So Trident 4, one of the things is future-proofing the enterprise network so we have the in-band, you know. We have a very rich feature set. One of the things we decided to do when we did a programmable chip was there's one way, there's two ways to do it. We can just give you a chip with nothing in it. It's like, go write your code, which isn't very useful. So we created a, a, a so we have an MPL load we provide to our customers, which basically has all the current features set in it. So they can just do that and use that as a basis to create new things. So, you know, we support V4, V6, switching routing protocols, Geneve, NAT, IP fix. All the things that you expect on a switch is like in like the default load on the chip. And if you want to add things to it, then you could go and add things to it. Like, you know, if you want in, an in-band flow analyzer, you could add that. You could add SRV6, which we're adding. You know, or some proprietary security tag you want to create. You know, all those things can be added to the base load. And it's like, you could do it or we could do it. You, know, you can ask us to implement MPL code or you can you know, write your own MPL code if you don't want to share, share that back and it's you know, your secret source to do something. <laughs> so the MP MPL development is much like any other compiled language tool chain. You write your MPL code, you compile it, you get a whole pile of, well, it's a little bit different in this bit. The compiler tool chain, you basically out of put, you get flex code, which is the co programming of the tables and everything for, for the chip. You also get the logical table database. The logical table database is basically what the op network operating system will program to control the chip. Historically, in a fixed chip, that would, be, would have been the registers and the table definitions. In a flexible chip, they're logical, so you basically, there's a logical table mapping between there and there. And we do that in a software component we call it SDK LT, SDK logical tables. And for a lot of our customers, they don't want to see this, so we also provide a legacy API map mapping mode. So if, you're, you, if the customer's used to calling BCM API VLAN create, there's a mapping for a particular DNA load, so you can call BCM VLAN create, and you, know, you don't have to worry about this, we've done it for them. But if you want to create new tables and new things like that, then you create that in the SKLT, and then the network operating system will program those tables. And yeah. But you know, it's very much like writing C code. And this is what a Trident 4 you know, this is basically a main loop on a very simple L3 switch program in MPL. So, you know, Trident 4 is basically we have the parser, we have tiles and special functions, the MMU, tiles and special functions, and the max. So the packet comes in, we parse the packet, so that's what this is doing. You know, parse begin, parse an Ethernet packet. Now, we'll basically take the, an Ethernet packet and pull all the fields out of it and put it up on the bus. Because in the chip, you basically, have this global scratch space called a bus, which marches down with the pack, which has all, all your variables in. Think of it as, you know, all your scratch memory. We do the port table lookup. Port table lookup is basically, if you do switch operating system, do switch forwarding, it's basically, you look at the port table, the, you come in this port, you look up the port table term, and okay, is this a lag? <coughs> is, is IP forwarding turned on? Is L2 forwarding turned on? So you basically, you pick up a whole pile of information about how should this packet be processed because it arrived on this port? Because arriving on a port doesn't mean it's like, you know, you arrive on that port, but it might be a member of a lag. So it's like you have a different, you know, it's a different number space for the lag. So you have to reference everything based on the lag, not on the physical port you came in on. Um, then you assign the VLAN. It's like, did this packet come with a VLAN? Is it a VLAN? You know, so you have to assign the VLAN. So you work out, if it came in tagged, okay, what was the default VLAN, which you, and you pick that up from the lookup in the port table. Then we do the v t VLAN table lookup in this code example. That would be like, if I'm in a VLAN and it's L2, is spanning tree turned on and the port blocked? I should drop this packet because it came on a port, I should drop it. Or did it come in on a port which isn't blocked, so I should do forwarding. Ingress L3 interface table lookup. Just because you arrived on a port doesn't mean it's L3 interface is the same because it's like it could be a member of lag or it could be a switch virtual interface like a VLAN. And it's like, okay, what is my L3 interface number? So you go, go grab that. RMAC table lookup, that's normally what everyone, um, you look up the MAC address to basically say, is it destined to my router's MAC address or is it to the HSRP address or is it to the VRRP MAC address to determine like, 
if it's destined to the router's MAC address, then you L3 forward it. If it's not destined there, you, you wouldn't L3 forward it, you L2 switch it. So you do that lookup. And you basically, in that bit function call, you call um, set the L3 enable, and then this code's doing, if that bit's enabled, then do the L3 forwarding. So do the fib lookup, blah, blah, blah. You know, then do the egress interface table lookup. Okay, work out what interface I'm going out on. Do all my packet edits, which is decrement TTL, change my MAC addresses. Then update the checksum. If it's IPv4, if it's V6, you don't do that. And that's it. So that's, a, that's an example of MPL code. Just curious. Um why the uh, decision to, to write NPL versus use something like P4? We knew this question was going to get asked. OK. We were, we've worked on Trident 4 for a number of years. P4, when we started Trident 4, was kind of moving around and changing. And there's also a pile of constructs we added into NPL, which are, when we analyze what we do in hardware, are not kind of present in P4. One of the things we do in hardware a lot is you Basically, you can look up the same table twice. You can do two reads into the same table simultaneously, which P4, does. they don't have a construct to do that. And why would you want to look up the same table twice? If you're doing like MAC addresses, you look up the destination MAC address to work out the egress port, but you also look up the source address to see, do I know this MAC address where it came from? So you could learn it that way. So there's certain constructs in P4 which aren't there. So we created, a, we, create, we looked at it and went, okay, we, you know, there's certain things which we need to do which aren't there, so we, that's why we created MPL. Okay. And plus P4 was changing a fair amount. It was like P414 and P416 are fairly different. There are some things which are kind of common between us and them, but it's, there's other things which, you know, it's just the way, we, you know, P4 is very tied to an RMT architecture for a pipeline, and that's not what we thought would be optimal. It's like, every stage being the same. Whereas when we look at the pipeline of the switching chip, there's, at the start, start, there's a few databases and there's a few tables you look up, but they're not very big. And in the middle, you have the FIB, which is huge. So it's like you proportion the memory into the right places. So it's kind of, it's, us building fixed chips kind of influence how we wanted to build a programmable architecture to you know, optimize it for packet switching. Yeah. Okay, so one program, programmability use case we did was um, latency-based ECN. And so after, after tr Trident 4 was taped out and the hardware came back, it was like we wanted to do latency-based ECN. Basically, latency-based ECN is like, instead of just looking at how full the buffer is and marking the ECN bits, we calculate how long was that packet sitting in the buffer. So when a packet comes in on our pipeline, we actually put an ingress timestamp on it. And when it comes out on the egress pipeline, we're going to look at what the current wall time is and subtract the two, and it's like, okay, if it's been sitting there more than a certain threshold, we, we then mark the ECN bits as well, and also ba based on the buffer depth. So we can do f cool new features like this by just changing the MPL code. Because before we would have to do this, we would have to wait, you know, wait till we did the next chip to get features like this in. One of the things in Trident 4, we have a lot of runtime programmability. It's like it's not just like write MPL code and that's how you get it. You also can do a lot of things at runtime, programmability at runtime to create features. We have the packet trace feature, so you can trace a packet through the system. So it's like, where is this packet? What, you know, what was the lookups on all the tables? What's it doing? Um, we implemented a new counter logic called um, Flex Counters 2, which gives us a whole pile of abilities to do really cool things like histograms. So we can bin things into particular bins, like we can create a latency monitor to say, What's the latency? You know, how long was this packet here between this and that one? Count it in that bin. If it's between this and that, that very count another bin. So we can create histograms in the device. We can create monitors. Like you can create a monitor on an ECMP group on the members. So you can see how much traffic is going on every member of an ECMP group. Um, we have packet drop visibility. For any reason why we drop a packet, you can now find out why. Um, load balancing criteria. We have a lot of criteria for how we, how we will load balance the traffic. And we can also create dynamic tables. So dynamic tables, basically, we can leave some of the fields in a table from an MPL program opaque, and then fill it, fill it, fill, and then they can get filled in at runtime, and we can do new, new and cool things with them. And we can do all the runtime programmability with no loss of, no, no packet loss. So we can add, you can, turn on, you can turn on packet tracing or packet drop visibility, and you have no packet loss when you add those features in. 
So what that allows you to do is high network availability and you get runtime flexibility. So let me give you an example. So one thing you can do is, like at runtime, create a DDoS attack to scheme. So to switch measures in hardware, the rate, the rate of packet of all flows. So what is the rate of all flows going through the system? And then we can calculate the average rate of SYN packets going through. And then we can calculate the current rate of SYN packets going through. And it's like, if the current rate of SYN packets is bigger than a delta off the average, then we can send you an alert, like generate a syslog. So the hardware would generate an interrupt to the, to the SDK, and the SDK would then, could, you know, the network operating system can get that and create a syslog to your IDS or something like that. So you can create new cool things like this with this kind of programmable infrastructure and runtime flexibility. And with all this counter infrastructure, you can, there's a lot of interesting questions you can start finally answering, which has always been interesting. Like, what is the maximum idle time and flowlet size? Like, how many number of packets are going and stuff like that? And how many packets were received at each hop. So you can, you know, you can build those profiles and then you can start like, okay, if this is deviating from the profile, you can detect network applications and anomalies. The thing we've worked, spent a lot of time working on is integrated security and visibility. So, you know, we aim to create segmentation with programmable group policies, um, adding in line rate maxsec, line rate IP, IPsec encryption, and also flow-based visibility. So learning to detect new flows, then applying policies to the flows, recording the flow attributes, and like then exporting the metrics of the, re of the records we recorded for the flows. Because what we see in enterprise networks, people are very interested in security of who's talking to who, and like, you know, okay, all, you know, one individual user can only get, you know, one megabit of YouTube, but altogether no one can take more than 10 megabits for YouTube. So, you know, with the group policy infrastructure, we can do things like that in the hardware. My favorite stuff. You know, I, I was thinking this morning, I remember when a 100 gig interface was like 300 watts each, and so you got two ports on a card. Proves how old I, old I am. You know, but now it's like, it used to be to get 128 ports of 100, 100 gig, you'd need like three chassis or more and stuff like that. To now, with Trident 4, we can do 128 ports of 100 gig on a single chip. And it's like, the savings in power and cost is amazing. And you can simplify the network so much more. It's like, instead of four or five tiers, you can do it in two. Or just do it, you know, bang, bang, it's like everything plugged in. Okay. Okay. So in summary, it's um, Triton 4 is like the highest bandwidth programmable silicon in the market today. Uh, the silicon consistency from access to data center. Uh, compile time and runtime programmability, you can, can change the MPL code or there's a whole lot of stuff you can do at runtime to add new, to do cool new features. It has a very rich concurrent feature set. You can do V4, V6 and MPLS and all kinds of tunneling stuff all simultaneously. And we spent a lot of time adding advanced instrumentation so you can work out where packet drops are, you can create INT probes or IFA and all kinds of things with it. And fundamentally, you know, it drives a disruptive change in CapEx and op OpEx because you can basically, you know, what, what would take so many systems now can all be fitted on one chip. <laughs>